Ringatia mai, waitia mai, tuhi tuhi a mare, ki te manawa tonu, te araha me te whakapono. Kia ora, Morena, and thank you very much for uh, the welcome, Fran. I thought I'd give a quick translation, though, of my um, opening mihi, given its relevance. Let it be expressed that relationships forged will always endure. We are separated by the mighty Pacific, but like the manu, we often traverse this to reacquaint with our friends. And today is a day where we are reacquainting with our friends. Can I begin by acknowledging our co-chairs today, Fran O'Sullivan and Michael Barnett, uh, US Ambassador to New Zealand, Tom Udell, and thank you um, for all of your engagement in the preparation of this uh, event, which we too hope will be annual. The Minister for Trade and Export Growth, um, the Honourable Damien O'Connor, and the excellent speakers and panellists who you'll hear from today, such as Rocket Lab's Peter Beck and Air New Zealand's Greg Ferran, to name just a few. Can I add my thanks also to the Auckland uh, Business Chamber who made today possible, and to all of you as participants who have given us the pleasure of being able to share some positive news and insights after what has been an incredibly tough few years. Today I come to you amid a six-month exercise of accelerating New Zealand's re-entry onto the world stage, and I'm incredibly proud to do so. The role of lead ambassador, as it were, is one that is easy to underestimate, and yet it's an enormous part of the job, especially in these complex times. As my recent trip demonstrated, it's a role that takes many forms, from political engagements to trade promotion, even when that entails an enthusiastic sales pitch to a room with two oversized kiwi fruit gently swaying to traditional Japanese music, <laughs> thus proving there is no lengths I will not go to promote New Zealand. <laughs> but as Fran herself put it, getting international cut through is what prime ministers must do, because what more important job is there? on the back of a proud national effort to successfully manage COVID-19, then, then to go into the world to remind people that New Zealand is open for business. Our pandemic strategy is now a matter of record. First elimination, then vaccination, then reconnection. It was a careful plan that always erred on the side of caution, which put lives and livelihoods first and delivered us the lowest deaths and hospitalizations in the OECD for two years, a larger economy than before COVID-19 and the lowest unemployment on record. A demonstration that is what is good for the health of our people is good for the health of our economy too. And now we shift gears. Our border has reopened. In fact, visa waiver countries, including the United States, re-enter from today. The movement of people is scaling up and the exports that are deep and solid roots of our economy, even throughout the pandemic, which shut so many other doors, are growing further still, with many opportunities possible within this period of economic recovery from COVID-19. So yes, Selling New Zealand to the world is a key part of my role as PM, but that has been the case for successive Prime Ministers, albeit in different international environments, some more complex than others. It is now more than 80 years since the first New Zealand Labour government took office. Michael Joseph Savage and his cabinet immediately confronted a global emergency, not a pandemic, but the Great Depression, a crisis affecting people across New Zealand and around the globe. Another crisis erupted again a few years later with the rise of fascism and world war. Those were times that forced New Zealanders and political leaders of the day to be clear about what they stood for and in doing so, who they stood with. By 1945, looking ahead to a future beyond war, the same Labour government then led by Peter Fraser worked in the UN San Francisco, San Francisco conference and other forums to shape a new system of global governance, building on the hard lessons of the 1930s and 40s to allow nations to rebuild shattered economies under the shelter of an enduring peace. The legacy of the Savage, Fraser and Nash governments has been on my mind because now is another one of those times when we as leaders and as a nation are reminded of what we stand for and not just to take a stand, but to act on those values. And it is that that helps explain New Zealand's bond with the United States over many decades. 
We have held firmly to our independent foreign policy, but also to our values. When we see a threat to the rules-based order we rely on, we act. Distance is not our deciding factor, and nor is the size of our contribution. In fact, looking back at where we have deployed our defence force over the years, I think we can say that New Zealand has been one of a smallish number of countries that has not only taken a global view of our security interests, but also a global view of our responsibilities and acted accordingly, and that includes today. We have all watched with horror Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It must be clear to all just what is at stake. Russia's actions are a threat not just to the lives and freedoms of the people of Ukraine, but also to the larger principles of sovereignty and self-determination that underpin nationhood. We were clear that Russia's actions demanded a direct New Zealand response. We worked around the clock to set up a legal framework to enact sanctions against Russia. We focused on direct support. New Zealand has so far committed assistance with $30 million towards humanitarian, military, legal and logistical needs. This includes a contribution to weapons and ammunition through funding direct to the UK. We've deployed 67 defence personnel to Europe to support these efforts. And we'll continue to stand by the people of Ukraine. After all, as the Ukrainian Prime Minister said to me at the beginning of the invasion, there is no big or small countries when it comes to this war just those countries who react. This, of course, is not the first occasion we've responded to a security crisis. At different times, we've deployed our defence force in Bosnia, Afghanistan, East Timor, and the Solomon Islands, Iraq, and in a different form in Bougainville. We've been prepared to incur costs and risks because to stand aside bears its own costs and risk, and because we have already taken a broad view of our interests and our responsibilities and because acting on your values, in good company, really matters. On Ukraine, we have been proud to work alongside democratic governments from Europe and our own region. The unity of response and collective determination to resist aggression could not be clearer. Here today, let me specifically acknowledge the leadership shown by the Biden administration. But we know that keeping the peace is not just a task for soldiers and leadership is not just the prerogative of the great powers. New Zealand's first Labour government knew that the post-war framework was not just about security. It was also about averting the conditions that drove the rise of fascism, the Great Depression, mass unemployment and beggar thy neighbour policies that drove a collapse in world trade. Post-war frameworks like the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, better known as the GATT and the Bretton Woods system, were for those who conceived them as much about keeping the peace as they were about rebuilding shattered economies. When Walter Nash signed the Havana Charter, the document from which the GATT was drawn, he will have been aware what a bold departure from past trade policy it signalled. Thanks to the vision and insight of President Roosevelt's Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, the GATT embodied those esoteric principles of non-discrimination, notably most favoured nation, that have allowed global trade to flourish. In moments when we have to deal with the political impulses driving new trade barriers, we must remember that the core GATT and World Trade Organisation principles began as a practical response to the brutal experience of the 1930s and 40s and are as relevant today as ever. I said before that leadership in world affairs is not just the prerogative of big countries. I believe New Zealand can take pride in the leadership it has shown over decades, not only in the WTO, but also in shaping the trade architecture of our own region. As you know better than most, this has transformed the ability of New Zealand companies to trade in markets and sectors previously closed to us. We can take pride in our record of leadership in a series of strategic trade initiatives, the New Zealand-Singapore Closer Economic Partnership, an unprecedented free trade agreement with China, working with regional partners to conclude ASEAN's high standard FTA, the ASEAN-Australia-New Zealand Agreement, the visionary P4 agreement with Chile, Singapore and Brunei, which became the foundation for an ambitious regional initiative, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, which Phil Goff and his team conceived and launched with the United States, the successor agreement, and I acknowledge you here today, Phil, 
the successor agreement, CPTPP. We can blame Canada for that snappy acronym, by the way. <laughs> is now setting new standards for trade and economic governance across the region and attracting strong interest from other capitals. And we are now breaking new ground with the next generation trade agenda through open plurilateralism initiatives such as the Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability and the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. I note that last year, President Biden ended federal funding of subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. We would welcome US engagement on the objectives underpinning the agreement on climate change, trade, and sustainability. Trade is part of the solution for slashing greenhouse gas emissions. When it comes to markets, there is more to it than trade rules. One reason we put such an uh, effort into APEC last year was the value businesses attached to good regulatory practice at and behind the border in the places of trade. I take great satisfaction from the success of our effort to ensure APEC got back on track after several hard years. It is now clearly once again one of the pillars of regional architecture and we have high hopes of the United States year in the chair in 2023. In the meantime, you'll know that in terms of future trade opportunities, it would be our preference to see the United States enter the CPTPP. It remains my hope that in time we'll be able to resume that conversation. We have our own commercial reasons for wanting that, but the stakes are much higher. It remains really important for the United States to be present and engaged in the economic architecture of our region because resilience and stability in our region is not solely defined by defense or military arrangements, but relationships in many forms. We've been having a conversation with American counterparts on this point, the need for engagement, and I believe it is fully registered. The real question is what form that engagement might take and how it responds to the changes underway in the geopolitical and commercial environment that we experience. You'll be aware of one big development. In the period ahead, I expect we'll be in a position, along with a number of others, to confirm our participation in President Biden's Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Initiative. <laughs> IPEF is not a traditional trade negotiation, but it does have a trade element. Digital trade is proposed as part of the agenda. It is important for New Zealand to be a part of any conversation where future rules for digital trade are on the table. We have always been challenged by our distance from major markets in our small scale. Digital offers opportunities to shrink those disadvantages. But it is also vital that we get the digital rules right, balancing openness and innovation with social values and security in a way that works for all New Zealanders. This means being inclusive as well as drawing on Te Ao Māori views on data and digital issues and maintaining a human-centric approach as we enter the era of artificial intelligence. Another reason for our interest is the IPF pillar covering clean energy, decarbonisation and infrastructure. The Indo-Pacific region accounts for over 50% of global carbon dioxide emissions, an initiative that brings together big emitters and has an explicit focus has real appeal to governments like ours that want to see collective action at scale and with a sense of urgency. The IPF initiative has also, also has a dedicated pillar covering supply chain resilience. I don't need to remind this audience how much this matters for business. I want to reassure you that we have not lost sight of the multilateral trade agenda. We have welcomed the Biden administration's renewed commitment to the WTO US leadership will be indispensable as we work to revitalize the WTO and shape the Geneva process to respond to new realities and challenges. As we emerge from the pandemic, trade needs to be one of the drivers of recovery. The WTO's ministerial conference next month is an opportunity for collective action, and our strong view is that the membership needs to grasp it. Just as we act at different times in response to world war, to the pandemic, to the Great Depression, we must act now in our response to climate change with urgency and decisiveness against a crisis that is impacting lives and economies now and which will only escalate further unless strong and joined up action is taken. 
And in that effort, the United States represents an incredibly important partner. The prosperity, security and well-being of New Zealand and our Pacific neighbours depend on an effective response to climate change, limiting the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees and transitioning our economy. The science shows the need for deep and urgent cuts to emissions. New Zealand is acting and we have high ambition. We updated our nationally determined contribution in 2021, requiring us to halve our emissions by 2030. This will not be easy, but an action would cost us more dearly. We'll shortly release our emissions reductions plan and emissions reductions budgets out to 2035, which will spell out the next steps every sector of our economy will need to take. We will do our bit to meet the global commitment to deliver $100 billion a year in climate finance. We've committed $1.3 billion to climate finance over four years. At least 50% of this will go into the Pacific, where the impacts of climate change are felt acutely for coastal communities and low-lying islands. At least 50% of our funds will go to adaptation action. Like the US, New Zealand has a 2050 target. We've legislated reduction targets for methane. We've worked together to finalise the Paris rulebook and drive global action. We cooperate in a range of environmental and sustainability forums, and we are both focused on developing trade rules that support our climate change objectives. Globally, carbon pricing and carbon markets will play a key role in our collective response. Pricing emissions, removing environmentally harmful subsidies, requiring financial disclosure of climate risks, these moves will ensure climate is present in all investment decisions, not just those of climate champions. Developing and connecting high integrity carbon markets will increase our ability to connect capital with opportunities to reduce emissions on the ground. Ultimately, these measures help finance to get where we need to go if we are to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. We have a strong interest in working with the US on carbon markets. But equally important is taking practical steps to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. We've been outspoken on this issue because continued fossil fuel subsidisation risks eroding any good work on carbon pricing by giving money back to emitters. Encouragingly, APEC agreed during New Zealand's host year to develop a plan to pump the brakes on further fossil fuel subsidisation above the current level of $500 billion. But further urgent action is required, including at the WTO, to bring an end to these and other environmentally harmful subsidies once and for all. And as I've said, I'm incredibly pleased to have the Biden administration on the side of this cause. So, to close, I want to look quickly to the near term. New Zealand is in demand. We do have a strong brand, and I know the team from NZ Story would have been cringing at some elements of that opening video. And we want to leverage those assets to support New Zealand Inc., including entrepreneurs and firms you'll be hearing from today, to do great things in the United States and other markets. I will be leading a business delegation to the US later in the month. In shaping a program, several themes have been top of my mind. One is to leverage the new work from anywhere culture that has taken off over the past couple of years. One of the few good things to come from the pandemic. In practical terms, it means distance is no longer the barrier it once was. Another is our sustainability credentials. Having an electricity supply that is already over 84% renewable really matters for many players in the market, as we are seeing with the big data center investments now being announced for the Auckland region. We need to strengthen these credentials and the relationships they bring. Then there is talent. The efforts of our movie makers, games developers, have put us on the map. New Zealand's creative sector has huge strength. We have an equally compelling story to tell on tech, innovation, whether we are talking software or space. Now we need to keep telling it. For reasons I've gone into today, over many decades, we have built a reputation as a good citizen of the world. This matters in a future where commercial success is increasingly about attracting the best international talent. We continue to offer a great environment for doing business and a great place to work, live and play. Most fundamentally, as we work to catch the eye of US firms and entrepreneurs who might want to partner or invest here, 
we offer a story built on values. The values that, among other things, drove our successful response to the pandemic. So New Zealand is open for business. And I stand ready to do whatever I can to support New Zealand business to do great things with American partners. I thank you once again for the opportunity to participate in this incredibly important event at such an important moment. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you, Prime Minister, for such a comprehensive address. And you look, I must say, very upbeat about being back in the world. I think there's a visible change in the way you hold yourself. Oh, I, I am uh, genuinely uh, enthusiastic, optimistic, and mm. enjoying the opportunity to, uh, to again, um, promote New Zealand on the world stage. Do you know, one small reflection, if I may, from mm. uh, the recent trip to Singapore and Japan, I think it's easy to forget uh, how much New Zealand draws from uh, seeing ourselves through the eyes of others. Mm. It's actually part of our culture and who we are. And so I think uh, seeing new, uh, our overseas visitors return today mm. uh, will actually uh, really, I think, bring back a piece that's been missing for New Zealand and New Zealanders. I do thank you for arranging that for today <laughs> while we're here to celebrate our reopening. I'm being a bit facetious, as you would guess. But anyway, hey, just before we get going, I'll ask one or two questions. We do have an opportunity for questions from the floor, and my colleague Tim will, will manage that. But I'm really interested in what you were saying right at the start, talking about the security dimension. Yeah. I mean, a year or so ago, we would have talked about how, you know, the, I guess the contest between the United States and China uh, had created problems for a small Pacific nation as to where it just places itself. But now we have Ukraine and we have Russia. We have huge tension in the world. And I wonder, is it time to rethink our security alliances and perhaps look with the US for something a little bit more stronger than what we currently have? Uh, that to me uh, would, you know, in the, in the question it almost poses this mm. assumption that our arrangements um, or our relationships are somehow currently inadequate. I don't consider that um, to be the case. Uh, do we, f though, if we look at some of the more recent arrangements that have emerged, AUKUS, uh, AUKUS is quite specifically uh, in this first iteration, and I do think it will evolve, that arrangement between the United States, the UK and Australia is very much around military procurement. Mm -hmm. um, but they have talked about the potential in the future for it to delve into additional spaces, and we've seen quite transparent reporting around where they intend for that to, to lead. So there is an opportunity for New Zealand to en engage in, in that development of those arrangements, but right now it's just not necessarily relevant to us. Um, quad, uh, those other arrangements, I do see them, uh, so long as they continue to put at their heart the interests of our region, uh, as being beneficial overall, and beneficial to New Zealand, regardless of whether we're direct members or not. So I don't consider that we have an exposed flank when it comes to security arrangements for New Zealand. We have strong partnerships and relationships, and we're seeing a growing engagement in our region. Uh, what is uh, really changing around us is the level of assertiveness and, and aggression we see in the region. So how are you going to continue, I guess, to straddle the relationship between the United States and also China, given uh, the recent uh, Solomon incursion? I think the first point to make is that New Zealand offers a really unique perspective. Uh, and I think it's often easy for us to be, you know, possibly dismissive about the role that we can play. But we are of the Pacific. Uh, we, I think, bring an insight that um, is pretty unique to us. Um, we have relationships with uh, a number of those, uh, of those players that are at the heart of some of these issues. And so sharing you know, our, our view, I think, matters. So let's not trivialize the role I think we can play. When it comes to what we've seen in the Solomons, look, this has been, uh, I think, building for some time. Uh, the Solomons switched its recognition uh, from Taiwan to uh, China in 20, I wanna say 2019, Chris. Uh, and since that time, we've seen that increasing um, engagement. The point that we keep coming back to in this discussion is actually, as a Pacific Island forum, which of course New Zealand is fully engaged with, let's make sure that we have a response via that forum. 
So it's not just New Zealand responding, it's not just Australia responding, it is our region. Let's strengthen the regional architecture that we have uh, and make sure that we as a region are responding to our security needs. And so that's where we've called for the Solomons because of the Biki Tower Declaration where we as Pacific nations said, if we've got security needs, let's meet them within our region. So calling on the Solomons to come, engage, tell us where there's a gap. Uh, because if there's a gap, we have uh, nations in New Zealand and Australia that are willing and ready to fill it. Um, and, and that's what we are doing now and what we'll continue to call for. I'll just wa ask one more question before we go to the floor, because I can see them uh, piling up, as you indeed can as well. Um, you talked earlier about the Biden administration and, and around CPTPP. Um, on your trip to the United States, do you hope to get that invitation to the White House when you can actually make that uh, I guess, plea centre stage directly, as well as all the other issues you've raised today? Well, I would say that um, the United States, first and foremost, is well aware of our position on CPTPP. Um, but I think we also need to recognise that we've been making a call for engagement in the economic architecture of our region for some time. And now in response, we have the um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. So let's acknowledge that clearly we're being heard. And it's come that, that we're being heard and the manifestation of that may be slightly different than where our ultimate aspiration would be, but we have an opportunity here on the table that we, that we are keen to work within. Uh, when it comes to the engagement politically, that's actually one of the points that I've been making is that during COVID, actually the political engagement did not drop by the wayside. Face-to-face -face is great, but uh, that is, we have not suffered in our relationships politically with others. In fact, that one thing that it probably drew out was leaders were less likely to wait for face-to-face -face opportunities. We tend to say, oh, we've got Unger in September, we'll do a bunch of bilaterals then. It actually, I think, led to more frequent bilateral engagement. This week alone, I've got um, talks with the Netherlands and mm -hmm with um, Pedro Sanchez of Spain. So we're actually keeping that up much more regularly than in the past, and I've spoken to Biden twice now as well. So these trade missions are just that. We are focusing on the face-to-face -face engagement for our business delegations and attaching on a bill of the political on the side. If I can put the question again. Oh, so I, haven't <laughs> I have not finalised, we haven't finalised yeah. the programme, but one thing I am very aware of is that we are yeah. at a time where geopolitical issues, Europe and in our own region, are pretty intense. Good luck on it anyway. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be waiting while you're in the United States for that potential call to come. Anyway, questions from the floor, Tim. Yeah, there's been a lot of questions come in. Um, there's one here uh, that asks what, what your thoughts are on indigenous trade opportunities in North America. I know that it was uh, indigenous inclusion in the economy was a big part of our APEC host year. So how might that continue? I see that as a significant opportunity for New Zealand. Uh, and you'll see that this is, I would say, not specific to any one region. Uh, in our host year within APEC, uh, this was the first time that we elevated Indigenous trade within that agenda. Uh, we used that opportunity as chair to do that. Um, so in every opportunity we've had, we've looked to elevate Indigenous trade issues. And it's part of our trade for all agenda, so we would look to do, and we look to do that in every market, but the United States, Canada, are particular areas where I think it will be a real strength for us. Mm. Uh, there's another one here that, that asks a little bit more about uh, sustainability, um, and, and notes that sustainability stretches across multiple sectors, including banking. How might we work together to form a sustainable infrastructure? A great question. Uh, you know, if I could draw an example, in our recent trade delegation into um, Japan and Singapore, we had the a Wellington-based company, Kogo, who are working um, uh, in the fintech space to create greater transparency so that consumers are able to identify via their banking data their own individual carbon footprint as a result of their consumer spend. The more transparency that we can build, the more opportunities we actually create for um, uh, services in those areas to help drive consumer demand towards more sustainable businesses. And so it becomes then the self-generating um, uh, opportunity in the market. Um, so I see banks play multiple roles. Um, there's on that end, the transparency for consumers. On the other end, uh, of course, we want to see generally more transparency uh, in the financial markets so that consumers can critique and governments can critique the degree to which we're seeing investment in fossil fuels and potentially stranded assets in the future. Mm. 
Uh, there's a lot of interest in this question here. Uh, I should note that they've all been from anonymous so far, so if you do want to put your name on there, I'll give preference to, to questions with a name. Uh, but there's a, there's a question here that asks uh, about the tech sector. It's had a big impact uh, through the past couple of years, um, but with skill shortages and jobs being offered in the US at quite competitive rates, what is the plan to be able to keep some of these skilled people in the country? Oh, this is, and this is where you'll, um, many will be aware of the industry transformation work that we've been trying, that we've been driving um, in this area. And I see on the Slido one of the questions as well around um, tech entrepreneurs tend to be forgotten about. Absolutely not. <laughs> we see this as, you know, a, an incredible opportunity for New Zealand. You would have heard me reference the fact that it's one of the ways that we overcome uh, so many of the barriers that we've previously experienced as a geographically isolated trading nation. Uh, so two things for us, A, how do we make sure that we're attracting, uh, uh, attracting those skills into New Zealand? There we've identified uh, that is a critical skills gap, so trying to take the friction out of um, visas. We have specific allocations to try and ensure that we have a free flow of those skills into New Zealand. But we have to grow our talent too. And if you ask, um, as I've tried to do every time I've been in front of a, um, a, a new emerging um, tech player or an existing one, what do you think will make the biggest difference to growing our own talent? Often they'll come back to the simple question of making sure parents and schools understand the opportunities that exist. Because despite the fact that we spend a lot of time um, thinking about how to attract uh, and recruit, our young people still get their careers advice from their parents. And our parents, they know what they know. My father was 40 years in the police. I spent a good ch a chunk of my uh, younger years thinking I would be a police officer. Uh, we need our parents to understand as well the opportunities that exist in these sectors. You know, we need, if a young person comes and says, I want to be a games developer, for a parent to say that is a great career opportunity, you're going to get an excellent remuneration as a grad in that space, how can I help you? So making sure that we build that understanding, understand the career paths and the training that's required, the NCEA credits mm. that are required to really build that sector. Mm. Uh, we've got some names coming in now, which is great. Uh, Francis Dignan from Beef and Lamb New Zealand asks, as current uh, global crises continue to demonstrate, the free flow of food is paramount. How do you see this issue being part of the IPEF negotiations? Yes, so free, the free flow of, of food, but also, and, and we've seen, look, you go into um, the Japanese market now and see the impact that the CPTPP has had for New Zealand in that market, enormous. Uh, IPEF is not a traditional trade um, uh, uh, framework uh, or market access agreement as it's being proposed. So I think we need to manage expectations in that regard. That does not mean it doesn't pose opportunities for New Zealand, and I highlighted a couple of those around um, uh, digital issues and sustainability. Uh, and you know, there is the potential to deal with regulatory environments and some of the friction that uh, um, trade and goods might experience. But in other, in other regards, it's, it's not a traditional trade arrangement, which is why, of course, we'll continue to highlight the importance of the CPTPP. Yeah, and perhaps just to continue that, a question here from Stephen Jacoby from the New Zealand International Business Forum. Uh, on the IPEF, how do we address our market access concerns in the US, uh, including tariffs on steel and aluminium, which will not be covered? Yeah. And so, look, I see, I see those as, as two separate issues um, uh, in a way. So first and foremost, we will keep talking about the CPTPP, and we will keep that um, aspiration on the table, as I note um, Japan and Singapore absolutely will as well. Um, uh, secondly, uh, we, on the trade in aluminium issue, um, that's obviously a grievance that we've, um, that we've had ever since its introduction. Uh, I notice where we've seen some variation, there have been limits still to that, so where we've seen some movement on where they have been introduced, often there's been quota attached to that. So uh, we will keep making the case that New Zealand is in a different set of circumstances than many of the other countries where they were imposed um, in terms of the trade deficit. And I, and I intend to keep doing that with our counterparts. Um, but uh, IPF then, as I've said again, is a, is a completely different uh, opportunity um, but we won't lose our ambition. Uh, just before you go, Prime Minister, down to Wellington for Cabinet, uh, I do know you want to hear the Secretary, uh, her comments before you go, but if I could just ask, you're going to have the enormous honour of speaking at Harvard at the commencement address. What's that one single message you want to give to students? 
um, uh, that we're not home to ducks and llamas. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that a lot. Um, when I write a speech, I, I spend most of my time thinking about what I'll craft and then a limited amount of time getting it down on paper, and so I'm in that phase at the, at the moment. Um, one, one thing, though, that when I think about every, every graduation, and reg regardless or, or every moment within um, someone's post-secondary education, and whether it's Harvard or whether it's Waikato University, mm. uh, I think just instilling in that, that generation the knowledge um, that uh, we know the challenges that, we, that they are facing, that we are not abandoning all of those challenges to them but that they need to never underestimate the power that they have to make the changes that we need them to. So there'll probably be an element of that, um, but I'm also um, thinking about some wider messaging. I need to write it first, though, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> I have started. If anyone would, I'm looking at Chris said he looks panicked. I have started. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Prime Minister, and, and uh, we do wish you well on the mission to the United States, both the political framework, which of course will come up somewhere along the way, and also uh, the business uh, leaders that you will lead, and I understand you will also go to New York as well as West Coast. Um, it's been a very comprehensive address. I think it's set out the depth and breadth of the relationship extraordinarily well, and we thank you very much for it. Thank you, thank and you. be prepared in the United States. It will be absolutely shameless New Zealand <laughs> promotion. Uh, I'm hoping, however, not to come across any more human-sized kiwi fruit. I'm looking at you, Zespri. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies Thanks. and gentlemen, please thank the Prime Minister.